this House believes pornography does a good public service. To start for the proposition, we've got Anna Spann, who is the UK's first female, um, first female adult film director. She's won numerous awards, and um, she stood for Parliament in May. Anna, would you open for the proposition, please? Here it goes. You look very daunting. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okie doke. At 16, I was a self-proclaimed feminist who believed that mainstream feminists and politicians like Claire Short were saying that porn degraded women. However, one day I was walking down Old Compton Street in London's red light district and I realised that my anger was in fact envy. I was envious of men having their sexuality catered for in so many different ways, from prostitution to magazines to films. In the late 80s, women's sexuality was not catered for at all. I instinctively knew that it was far more productive and feminist to invest my time in creating something that allowed women to explore their sexuality than it was to thwart men's freedoms. I knew instinctively that sexual objectification, that is, fleetingly some, seeing somebody only for their sexual attractiveness alone, is something women and men do alike. During my degree, I read Jacques Lacan, whose work tells us that whatever gives you pleasure gives you power. This throws the traditional mo model of vertical power into question. He states that whatever interests you sexually is what you should practice, law willing. So if you're sexually submissive, you are disempowered if you do not admit this to yourself as you deny yourself access to pleasure. Women and men tend to be either sexually submissive or domineering or a mixture of both. And this is only a limited amount to do with gender. To understand pornography, it's important to understand this point. Pornography is not acting out politics. Pornography is the acting out of the imagination and role play. It is more useful to liken it to a game or a sport than it is to everyday life. Imagine telling boxers that their sport sets a bad example. Porn stars and directors get power from expanding the limitations of their imaginations and bodily experiences. Anti-porn feminists make mistake extreme sex with a lack of consent. They compare sex to the rest of social life. This is one of their fundamental mistakes. This is not to say that, it, that there is no inequality in the porn industry. It is certainly the case that women are encouraged to play submissive roles in some films. But when anti-porn moralists say that the worst thing about porn is women are being seen to be enjoying being raped or being abused, they effectively say that regardless of how much autonomy, education and will of personality a woman has, she cannot consent to being in or consuming porn, or therefore for being anti-porn either. This position is not based on expanding women's rights. It's a thinly veiled conservative stroke religious argument that firmly keeps women within the whore Madonna dichotomy that every decent feminist and woman has been fighting to escape for decades. Let's be clear, books on gender studies and pornography are at least 50% in volume positive towards the industry and these books make up the last 20 years of study whereas the anti-feminist stance is made up mostly of work from the 1980s and I say that as someone that's studying a PhD in gender studies. There is not a campaign to say, theirs is not a campaign to save women and children. Theirs is a fully fledged moral panic as per Stanley Cohen's influential book Folk Devils and Moral Panics. Using his theory, the porn producers have been chosen as a soft target for moral entrepreneurs to project a whole host of society's ills on to one identifiable culprit that can be eliminated. We have been here before in 1984 with the Video Recordings Act when Mary Whitehouse et al. stated that nearly 40% of all six-year-olds watched video nasties. This was easily refuted by journalists who found six-year-olds admitting to seeing films that did not exist. When people like Shelley Lubbin make claims, without any sense of irony, that 66% of all porn stars are carrying a disease that is, by her own admission, not tested for, one has to ask how much are the facts being relayed to the public? Do her audience know that her STD statistics are grossly inflated due to the inclusion of multiple retesting by the same performers? In October of last year, I had the pleasure of being a filmmaker in FOMUS at the focus 
at the Berlin Porn Film Festival, along with several other female porn directors. In fact, you could say that the cutting edge is pretty much made up of female and queer filmmakers alike, who are motivated by changing perceptions of sexuality and having their unique voices heard. This is in stark contrast to, to Gail Dines' claims that she has spoken to, and I quote, hundreds of porn producers, and the only thing they get excited about is profit. I've yet to hear of anyone who has actually been approached by Dines either. Moral entrepreneurs fundamentally see women as victims, which in turn encourages women to see themselves as victims. It is this anti-porn feminism that gave men the power to taunt women with porn in offices and private lives as a tool which is mistakenly seen as shorthand for female disempowerment. Going through some of their arguments, it doesn't take long to see they are deeply flawed. For instance, the argument that co porn causes rape. Both the US government twice and the UK government and wealthy American Christian stroke conservatives have all tried to prove a link between porn and rape and failed. They have also failed to account for the high prevalence and acceptance of rape in countries like the Yemen and Afghanistan who have outlawed porn for many years. In our own country, women's rights were not better before the printing press as the first way that pornography was distributed came into being. Even if a strong correlation between the instances of childhood sexual abuse and the likelihood to appear in porn could be proven, the question of whether survivors use porn as a means of addressing and re-owning their sexuality is never asked by on moral entrepreneurs. But what about children and pornography? Regarding porn leading to paedophilia, again, no proof has ever been found. The industry has be, always been very proactive in separating themselves from any child pornography or any sales to under-18s for moral and financial reasons. Yet if children are accessing pornography, and I don't disagree that this may not be good for them, the emphasis has to be on good parenting and the use of blocking software for children, not to take away freedoms from the majority of responsible adults for the sake of a few irresponsible parents. But what about the health of the porn stars? I've always operated a policy that porn stars can use condoms if they want to. Us producers worldwide do not take this lightly. We couldn't afford to. The main reason why producers and porn stars don't use condoms is because they break, they dry up, you use seven or eight in a shoot, and men lose their erections. Everybody's day is delayed due to this, bearing in mind that the UK industry hasn't had one case of HIV ever, and that compared to the out outside the industry, we have far safer for HIV transmission rates, it's no wonder that the vast majority of models aren't joining in with Shelley to campaign for condoms in films. This is in stark contrast to Shelley Lubbin's account, which I will leave her to tell you. However, I would just like to point out some of the issues that have been raised about her account. AIM Healthcare, among others, have refuted nearly all of her health statistics, and the LA Times removed a story based on her interpretation of the statistics. At least one porn star has accused her of being directly exploitative, and others have strongly disagreed with her methods of recruitment. Lubin's degree in theology is not from a college recognised by the US Department of Education or Council of Higher Education accreditation. The college has been sent cease and desist orders too. Lubin says that her incurable herpes was in fact cured by God and that he would cure porn star Brooks AIDS. She blames the industry for her cervical cancer, which is, which is in part caused by high level of sexual activity on performing in 30 films rather than her history of working as a prostitute for six years. She blames the industry for three miscarriages when two of these reportedly happened before entrance to the industry. When previously asked to prove she has had herpes, she replied that it was up to the interviewer to prove that she hadn't. She has pointed out the problems with condoms splitting and causing STDs and pregnancy from her experience as a prostitute, and yet advocates this method for the industry. And she has not publicly considered how having bipolar disease may have affected how she experienced the industry emotionally or why she got into it. But this debate is focused on why the porn industry is good for society, so allow me to give you a few good reasons. The porn industry pays the wages of hundreds of thousands of taxpayers who pornogra choose pornography as their career. Remember, it's not just the pro-porn industry, but also the anti-porn industry who provide revenue to the tax man. Remember, Miss Dines is here promoting three books against the industry, and Miss Lovins is promoting her book and a charity that pays 39% of its gross income in wages to her. 
Miss Lovins is also keen to attract porn stars with offers of fame and greater financial reward, according to her outreach email to Taryn Thomas and others, where she states that MTV will be offering pay I quote, be offering pay as well as you will be on a mainstream TV series and get much more exposure and many better opportunities than what porn could ever offer you. Pornography develops and popularises new technology. This has always been the case since 8mm films. Pornography is a good vehicle for learning about the human body. It is where most men learn where the clitoris, A spot and G spots are. Unlike most me mainstream TV and film, pornography actually <coughs> democratises the body. There is a market for literally anything in pornography. I often say to women who don't like something about themselves, for instance body hair or body size, stick it into Google and add the word sex after it and you will find a a whole host of sites that think this is the most attractive thing about you. <coughs> the porn industry is organised around the women who perform in it as they decide their limits and are hired on that basis. It is the only industry I know where a woman's period is a good reason to change a shoot date to suit. Being a mother or indeed being pregnant simply means that you sell to a new and different market. Compare this to the... <laughs> I wondered how you'd take that. Compare this, um, compare this to the banking industry, where women have to ignore their female traits and bodies pretty much in order to get on. Conclusion. It is important to be aware of moral entrepreneurs and moral panics. Please don't vote for an argument that says the world is going to hell in a handcart. It isn't. The world is simply a complicated place in which civil liberties must be maintained and democracy respected. Thank you. By the way, it's four books, not three. <laughs> By way of an introduction, let me explain that I, although I make my money in the halls of the Academy as a lecturer in sociology and women's studies, I am at heart an anti-porn radical feminist activist. Evidently, this means I am an anti-sex, sex-negative, sex-moralist, sex-phobic prude who wants to censor what you think, read and do in the bedroom. According to my many male fans on the internet, I am driven to such extremes for one very specific reason. And here I am quoting precisely, Gail Dines, what you need is a good fuck. <laughs> now we have that out of the way, let's get to the heart of the matter. Does porn do a good, pub does porn do a good public service? I would love to say yes. Believe me, no one more than me hopes that I am wrong and that my colleagues on the other side are right. I so want porn to be a harmless fantasy that empowers women and provides men with much needed sexual advice on how to please a woman. <laughs> I want porn to be everything my opponents say it is. Why? Because the alternative view that it is a powerful and articulate disseminator of woman-hating ideology means that we as a culture are in deep trouble. If I am right, then what we are talking about tonight has very real implications for how you will live out your life as citizens, as professionals and as gendered beings in a culture that is increasingly becoming pornified. Pornography is a massive industry that is estimated to be $97 billion worldwide. It releases over 13,000 new porn films every year. There are 420 million internet porn pages, 4.2 million porn websites, and 68 million daily porn search engine requests. Any industry this size, whether it sells food, cars or clothes, is going to shape the economic, sexual, cultural and political landscapes that we all inhabit. To suggest otherwise is to ignore the power that capitalist industries have in moulding human behaviour. And you don't need to be an expert in Marx, Foucault or Gramsci to know this. The fashion industry shapes the way we dress. The food industry the way we eat. 
the sex industry the way we think and do and talk about sex? How can it not, given that it is the main producer of discourse about gender, sex and sexuality? It is a powerful form of sex education, with the average age of first viewing porn now down to 11 for boys. And let me tell you, this is not their father's playboy. Point of information? No. Rather than sporadic trips into a world of coy smiles, provocative poses and glimpses of semi-shade je female genitalia, boys and men are catapulted into a never-ending universe of ravaged anuses, distended vaginas and semen-smeared faces. Websites with names like Gog on, Gag on My Cock, Suck Me Bitch, Ghetto Gaggers and Human Toilet Bowls make clear that today's porn is about making hate to women's bodies, with sex acts designed to deliver the maximum amount of brutality, humiliation and degradation. On the site advertising the movie, Anally Ripped Whores, the text reads, and I quote, We at Pure Phil know exactly what you want, and we're giving it to you. Chicks being asked fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy, and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. Over at Gag Me and Then Fuck Me, the text advertising a movie with Laura reads, The last thing we needed was a vomiting girl, but this time it was close. Stopping is not our style, so she was grabbed by the head and face fucked as if there was no tomorrow. She tried hard to swallow, but there was too much muck, and the bitch had no real choice but to take it all. Before you think I spend hours looking for the worst, let me tell you I get to all of these within 20 seconds of typing porn into Google. These examples are drawn from that subgenre of porn that the industry calls gonzo. Defined as wall-to-wall -wall sex without a storyline, Gonzo is, according to Adult Video News, the trade journal of the industry, the most profitable to pornography there is. It is the porn of choice for men when masturbating alone. Of course, Gonzo isn't all, all there is, and any aficionado of porn will tell you that there are literally thousands of subgenres that cater to almost any imaginable taste. But most of these are marginalised, and their existence does not in any way invalidate my argument that the majority of porn that men consume is brutal and degrading. For this reason, Gonzo has more cultural power than subgenres such as woman-friendly porn or so-called feminist porn. Most of porn is produced within a capital industrial setting, which does to sex what fast food does to food. It commodifies it, and you end up with a product that is generic, formulaic, and plasticized, totally lacking in creativity, imagination, authenticity, and individuality. This is what it means when a product is industrialized, and this is why it is ridiculous to suggest that being anti-porn is the same as being anti-sex. When I criticise McDonald's, no one accuses me of being anti-eating, since people understand that I am critiquing an industry and an industrial product, not a human act. Understanding that porn is an industry means that it needs to be seen as a business, whose product evolves within a specifically capitalist logic. It is a business with considerable political clout, with the capacity to lobby politicians, engage in expensive legal battles, and use public relations to influence public debate. It is a business that is increasingly able to deploy a sophisticated and well-resourced marketing machine, not just to push its wares, but to cast the industry's image in a positive light. It is a business that interfaces with credit card companies, mobile phone companies, search engines, satellite and cable companies, venture capitalists, hotels and real estate developers, to name just a few. For example, the Free Speech Coalition, the lobbying organisation of the US industry, was successful in changing the child porn laws in 2002, so that now, thanks to the porn industry, we have an explosion in images of young women made to look barely pubescent females. To suggest that porn images have an effect is to be branded as an unsophisticated thinker who mistakes fantasy for reality. But if their pornographers and their apologists are right, and images have no effect, then why do corporations spend billions of dollars on advertising every year? Why do historically oppressed groups such as blacks argue that racist images make life intolerable for them? Why did the Nazis develop a sophisticated propaganda images against the Jews? And why do left-wing sociologists such as myself feel despair when the Daily Mail, Fox and indeed all corporate-owned media spews out right-wing ideology about the poor being dumb, lazy and scroungers on the state? 
We despair because we know that media has a profound effect on shaping the way people think about reality. And pornography is one particular powerful type of media, since it sends messages to men's brains via the penis. In porn, women are not human beings who need good jobs, safe housing, equal pay or free daycare for their children. No, in porn, women are a bunch of whores, sluts, cunts and cum dumpsters who need nothing more than a good fucking. These cum dumpsters have no bodily integrity or limits or desires outside, of course, of being fucked. And whatever men want to do to women, surprise, women want it too. It is in fact a perfect pre-feminist world where men don't have to deal with pushy, mouthy, ambitious women who nag about pesky things like equal rights, fair pay and free childcare. In poor land, boys can be boys and don't have to deal with women because in porn there are no women, only hot girls, lots of them, and they're disposable because once you're finished with one, then another comes along and then another and then another. Now the problem here is that these men who use porn, your colleagues, are the very ones who run the world. They're the politicians, the lawyers, the bankers, the economists who decide how women and their children are going to live. They are going to make laws and policy about equal pay, <coughs> rape, battery, access to welfare, housing and education. And what do they see when they look at a woman? A full and equal being or a fuck object who has a sell-by date stamped on her forehead? So before we all celebrate just how empowered we women are today, what with our feminist porn and endless choices to be strippers and prostitutes, let me give you a dose of reality. There are currently 143 female, female MPs out of a total of 650. That means there are at this moment 507 men who are deciding what budget cuts to make, the burden of which will fall on the shoulders of women and children. Today, women's hourly pay in this country is 19.3% less than men. The number of homeless women in the UK has risen by nearly 80% in five years, and older single women have a 24% chance of living in poverty. And on a global scale, women perform 66% of the world's work, produce 50% of the food, but earn 10% of the income and less than 1% of the property. Clearly, it is not only important that women are fucked. This has to change. And the only way it is going to change is if we wrestle power away from men. We have to stop giving them total and complete power over women's lives and bodies. Porn tells men lies about women. It tells them that women don't matter, that they have an unquestionable right to do whatever they want and that they have nothing to fear from us because we won't fight back. But they are wrong. The job of feminism is to fight back. And where better to start with the refusal to collaborate with the woman-hating pornographers? Because in a world where women have full equality, there is no place for pornography. Thank you. who's flown in from San Francisco. She calls herself <laughs> the sex academic for her focus on cultural analysis and sexual biology. She's a writer, public speaker and a sex educator in America. So Jessie, thank you very much. So I was going to start with an introduction, but because I wasn't allowed to give my point of information, I will just do it now. Uh, the statistic about children viewing pornography at the age of 11 came from a website called Top Internet Filter Review, which is run by a man named Jerry Repletto out of Huntsville, Utah. This is a false statistic which came from a man named Mark Castleman, who is a self-proclaimed former porn addict, and an author of a self-published book called The Drug of the New Millennium. When Seth Lubov in 2005 for Forbes magazine pressed this man about where the statistic came from, he said, I quote, I don't remember where I got that from. That is a very common statistic. This number is made up and it came from nowhere, and it is evidence of Dine's either terrible research or very good cherry picking of data. The actual data for when people are introduced to porn or when they're seeking it out came from Kimberly Mitchell and Michelle Yabara. Kimberly Mitchell is from Crimes Against Children Research Center. Michelle Yabara is from the Inter -Solu Internet Solutions for Kids. Out of a random sample survey of 1,500 kids aged 10 to 17, they found that they didn't start seeking out internet porn until the age of 14. At the age of 14, most people have started going through puberty, and this is a very common age to be sexually curious. So... Now I will go on with my actual research. And don't worry, don't worry, there's far more. I don't know if any of you have read her book, but 
I did a lot of work within sociology courses and I graded a lot of papers and I had to look at where people were getting their research. And I'm sorry, but details magazine opinion pieces do not count as a citation source. <laughs> now, yes. Clinic. I was there for three years. We had people as young as nine coming in uh, for condoms, all of which had seen pornography. I find it interesting, but I would like to see the actual data that's behind it and how many people are coming in. Because the thing is, while we can bring in antidotes when we're talking about sexuality, when we really want to get a good idea of what's going on, the plural of antidote is not data. When we want to look at what is happening within a population, we need, especially around something like sexuality, which is very ideologically driven, we need to be very careful about how we are doing our research. Now I will start with my introduction. The first time I saw pornography was a little bit younger than the first person, or the average age. I was about 12 years old. It was called Spies. Not much of the movie had to do with spies other than at the beginning of the end and a very ra vague reference to some kind of microfiche. The pornography that Gail Dines described is nothing like what I saw. I saw bodies of color. I saw thin bodies. I saw thick bodies. I didn't see a lot of double anal, double vaginal, or any of that. I didn't find it particularly traumatic. It did make me curious. A year later, when I was in a hotel room and my mother was out, I was able to order some on pay-per-view. It was called Bad Wives 2. It was very interesting. It starred Stephen St. Croix, I believe, which I later was able to meet, and I was too nervous to tell him that I had seen one of his porns when I was 13. <laughs> I went on with my curiosity about pornography, and I founded a group called Girls Watch Porn. Because with all this pornography out there, we were very curious about what is it that exists in the world, and what is it that could possibly turn us on. The first film that we saw was called Getting Wet, and we almost disbanded. It was really bad. It was one of the first, to date, one of the worst pornos I've ever seen. Horribly filmed, women with those dragon fingernails trying to give each other, like, hand jobs. It was just terrible. But we pressed on and we kept watching films. Because one thing I can say about pornography is a lot of it is terrible. But it's not terrible about its messages about women. Because those messages about women are in the rest of our culture. It's not as if misogyny only exists within pornography. It exists everywhere. And we pressed on and we managed to find films that we did like. And they were absolutely diamonds in the rough, and they were difficult to find. And through this curiosity, I ended up pursuing sexuality as a form of study. I have 120 hours in sex education training. I've been doing sex education for maybe five years now. I speak at universities. I speak to people in bars, in clubs, on the streets, wherever I can, because I'm not driven by an ideology about sex, which you can all speak to me later. I'm not driven about an ideology about sex. I'm driven about a curiosity about sex. I went on to get my master's degree, which I received last year after conducting original research on sexuality. So the sexademic thing isn't quite self-proclaimed. I do have a degree in it. And one of the things that I found when I started studying it is that pornography or sexually explicit materials have really been with us forever. Sexually explicit images you can find in Grecian times, in Roman times, in ancient India. And people like to look at these and very conveniently say, well, because it was in history, it was art. No, these people are fucking in these images, absolutely. And you start to see a restriction happening with the rise of Christianity where they begin to treat prurience and pleasures of the flesh in a very negative light. In the late 1700s, you start seeing another rise in pornography coming about. Fanny Hill, Memoirs of a Woman in Pleasure in 1749. William Alcott's A Young Man's Guide, which was actually a sex guide in 1833. And Alex Stockholm's Togology, A Book for Every Woman. These were sex guides, but they were also very sexually explicit. And they managed to kind of slip in these sexually explicit materials under the radar. Then you had, in the Great Depression, Tijuana Bibles, which were absolutely pornographic magazines. Porn did not start coming about just during the Playboy era. It was happening long before then. A Grass Sandwich in 1915 was one of the first stag films of hardcore pornography. 
And at that time, these stag films were taken around the country by men with projectors, and they were shown in ale houses and in anywhere where they could meet. And it was mostly men coming together to watch these. And what you found in these pornos is not too different from what you find now. It's mostly blowjobs, rarely cunnilingus, lesbian scenes are very popular, and actually at the time you were more likely to see bestiality than you were any acts of homosexuality. And I've seen some. I've seen some films from this time, and it's a little shocking to what our tastes are today. So it's not as if pornography is steadily increasing and getting worse and worse and worse. There's nothing all that new about it except for the cinematography where we can take a camera and get right, right up close. So porn has been around forever. Yes? I totally agree with you, and that's a nice um, piece of history. But what about cuts like 18 and abused? I think that goes too far. You think it goes too far? Yes. The way that I would address that is because we're allowed, we are able to make so, it's so easy to make a porn. You and I could grab a camera right now, <laughs> go in the back of the <laughs> and we could go make a pornographic film. And because of that, you see a much wider representation of different kinds of sexuality. And are there people out there who dislike women and who feel violent towards women? Absolutely. And it's pretty simple for them to pick up a camera and make a porno. Does that mean that all porn is like that? Absolutely not. And increasingly you see different people representing different types of sexuality for porn. Another thing that's always been around is censorship. Political and religious institutions have always sought to restrict access in production. Sexually explicit materials are characteristic, though, of a democratic and economically affluent culture. Dictatorships and repressive regimes always seek to suppress sexual expression because sexual expression is something that is so individual. Our sexualities and our desires are as individual as a fingerprint. And if you want to have a dictatorship, the last thing that you want to do is have affluent, widespread individuality. And in many ways, from Pope Paul IV in 1563, taking erotic books and putting them on the list of the index of Librorium Provatorium. I'm sorry, I don't speak any Latin. In 1711, you had the first anti-pornography statute in the United States, which was passed in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Then the famous Comstock Act in 1873, Hayes Code of 1822, and the Miller Test, which sought to define obscenity one minute remaining. I'm going to rush it then. So what about porn is so upsetting? Writer Stanley Kaufman said, porn is ruthless. It proves that love or anything remotely like it is not essential to sex. It is an affront to restrictive religious and political ideologies. Lisa Duggan, a writer, says, the existence of pornography has served to flout conventional sexual mores, to ridicule sexual hypocrisy, and underscore the importance of sexual needs. Pornography carries many messages. It advocates sexual adventure, sex outside of marriage, sex for pleasure, casual sex, illegal sex, anonymous sex, public sex, and voyeuristic sex sex. And the thing is, overall, most adults approve pornography for personal use. It has widespread personal acceptance and general tolerance for its availability for adults. Porn on porn and satisfaction, Lisa Palak, who used to follow Andrea Dworkin, wrote an essay called How Dirty Pictures Changed My Life. And she said, once I figured out how to use porn and come, my life was irrevocably changed. For the first time in my life, I felt sexually autonomous. And this is especially important for women as they are discouraged from masturbation and taught their sexuality exists for others. It shows diversity in genitals and diversity in bodies more than is in any other type of media. I'm going to skip ahead. Sex therapists often recommend pornography to couples. It can spice up your sex life and solidifies a relationship. If there is anything that is going to kill a relationship, what is it? Boredom. You don't like the other person anymore. There's nothing that actually ties you to them. You can divorce them. You can break up with them. It can be really helpful for anybody that is in a staggering marriage. There can be porn and personal perceptions. Um, I'm going to skip ahead again. Self-perceived effects of porn 
porn consumption, you find that men and women are actually reporting a lot of moderate positive effects of porn. In Williams et al., Pornography, Normalization, and Empowerment from 2009, students were self-reporting their pornography viewing as decreasing their anxieties about sex and their own sexual proclivities. Sexual schemas were not substituted or replaced but expanded by watching pornography. And a few of their quotes, because I watch so much porn, I have confidence when I give oral sex to my partner. Watching porn led me to be less afraid to be loud, made me feel less guilty about wanting sex, wanting pleasure, and directly asking for it. Porn is a necessary side of desexualized public life. When in daily life we are not running about naked, we need to restrain ourselves sexually in order to interact with each other. Sometimes you need a catalyst that reminds you what sex sounds like, what sex looks like. You need something to spark you and spark that passion in you when you've been repressing it all day long. It's cathartic to those who do not have sex with others. For the disabled, for the shy, for the geographically isolated, the physically unattractive, the divorced, the widowed, those who are not ready to have a relationship with another person. It is validating to marginalize sexual identities for gays, lesbians, and trans people. And porn is a way to examine social and personal sexual values. It allows viewers to safely gauge their reactions Actions, and right now it sparks public debate about sexuality and what is important. If we did not have these images, we wouldn't be able to have these debates and draw our lines about what is appropriate. And I'll end there. Thank you. He is a child psychologist and an expert on child and family development. He is a fellow of the British Psychological Society and believes that pornography has a proven negative influence on children. So Dr. Wilson, thank you very much. You know, earlier uh, this week I watched the film The Fighter. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, but the final scene is the world heavyweight uh, boxing fight and I feel I'm standing in the ring and watching the partners sparring at one another. Now over the next few minutes I'm going to argue that pornography is not good for society, is not a public service because it is not good for children. I will demonstrate that a substantial number of children watch pornography and that in doing so, this has a distorting effect on their development in terms of their attitudes and their behaviour. Now I'm going to draw on research findings, but I'm not going to list every single source, this journal, that journal and so on, because that will take up too much time. But I can assure you that my sources are not whatever was said they are, my sources are good psychology journals and I'm happy to give the specific details uh, afterwards to anyone who's interested. Now in my argument that psychology is not good for children, I am not going to use the fact that a substantial amount of por pornography involves children in the films themselves. And indeed we know that in, in 2007 alone, as an example, just in that year, the child pornography industry was worth $3 billion just in that year. Now that cannot be good for children. I'm not going to use the fact either that research has shown that 80% of convicted child molesters admit to using child pornography to stimulate themselves before the commissioning of a sexual crime against a child. Or they use pornography to show their intended victim, this is what normal people do. It's perfectly okay. I'm going to push that fact to one side. I'm going to use a much more mainstream argument, and that is that por pornography is bad for children, uh, is, is, is therefore bad for society. The argument is based on the terrifying statistic that a significant number of children watch pornography. 
Now, you can look up any survey. You, can, you don't need to be stuck to one particular source. You will find that is the case. A significant part watch porn. There is not one piece of pornography that exists today in the media, in the printed work, in the internet, on television, that a child cannot access. And to say simply that this is the parent's responsibility is absurd. There's not one of you here that can't access pornography before your parents have even worked out how to switch the computer on. <laughs> so to suggest that, that it can be controlled is simply untrue. It's not, it's not, it's not practical. Uh, not at the moment, thank you. But let's look at the statistics. Survey after survey. And maybe you can pull down one survey, maybe you can pull down another survey. But you look at the overall the total of surveys, on average they will tell you that 8 out of 10 children between the ages of 8 and 16 have viewed pornography. Most often by accident, with only one or two clicks away from it. And the average age, despite what is being disputed, research shows the average age of first viewing is 11. Now, of those 80% of that group of children who view pornography, roughly 30% become habitual viewers. They view it regularly. Now, why should that be a worrying statistic? Why should I stand here and say, well, that's concerning? What's troubling about it? Well, it all comes down to the concept of readiness. Now, in child development, readiness is crucial. Child development is a series of stages that you go through, and the child naturally moves from one stage to the next when he's ready. Now, you think of a young baby who's crawling. They will start to walk when they are psychologically and physically ready to walk. No one needs to tell a baby how to walk. They do it spontaneously. The same applies when learning how to make friends, when learning how to count, and it also applies when developing sexual understanding. It's about readiness. Now, there are two aspects to readiness. The first is timing. What happens if a child is not ready to move to the next stage of development, but he is pressurized into doing so? What happens? Well, generally the effect is disastrous. If you were to take, mention the baby, you take a baby who's crawling, and you try and force them to walk, and you harass the baby, walk, try this, try that, the baby's view, firstly, aside from the, the physical damage, the baby's confidence about walking, the attitude to walking, the anxiety, everything that's associated with that will be disrupted. So the time the baby is ready to walk, it, the whole view of walking will, will be distorted. The same applies to sexual understanding. If a child is not ready for mature sexual understanding and is not ready for, for, uh, to understand sexual activity and sexual behaviour, the effect of pornography will be to create anxiety, distortion and misunderstandings. And common sense must tell you that cannot be good for children. The second part of readiness is context. When a child is ready to move to the next stage of development, the specific experiences that they have at that time will have a profound effect on how that stage turns out. Now let's take the kid who's walking. I'm going to give an extreme example. Let's say a child is suddenly ready to walk, and the parents say to them, uh, every time they walk, the parent shouts at them, that's hopeless the way you're walking. Uh, you should only walk uphill, you should walk in one leg, and so on, and totally harass the child and give a distorted view of that. The child's development at that point will be distorted. And the same applies to a teenager. Let's assume a teenager is ready for sexual understanding, is ready to be sexually active, and to have a good se sexual relationship. What is the impact of pornography? It is to distort that development at that stage. Because pornography is about sex without care. It's about degrading women. It's about the abuse of power. Now, that cannot be good for a child who's ready to, to move into a, a, a good phase of sexual development. But don't just take my word for it. You look at the evidence... Research shows that child viewing and pornography, or children viewing pornography, affects them in two ways. First of all, their attitudes. 
we know, for example, that boys who habitually view pornography tend to um, uh, have a, a, they're a higher level of tolerance of sexual harassment. They basically think sexual harassment is acceptable. Boys and girls who view pornography tend to have a more disrespectful view of women, tend to view women as sex, as sex objects, and tend to place less value on fidelity and faithfulness in sexual relationships. So that's the attitudes. What about the behaviour? We know that pornography, for boys and girls who view pornography, of 80% of teenagers who view pornography, of all teenagers who view pornography, sorry, 80% of them say that they want to act out what they see or some of the things that they see in pornography. They want to act out, and of that 80%, Around 30% admit to trying to act out what they see within 48 hours of the viewing. Now that has to be worrying. We also know that children who habitually view... Yes? I think we have detailed information which porn they have seen what they want to do. Maybe it wasn't Gonzo, but like a normal porn film. Well that's an interesting point, but I don't think I would want a 14 year old to be acting out what they see in a normal porn film. Because I wouldn't know what a normal porn film is, and I don't know how you would define that. Anyway, and we also know that children who habitually view porn often exhibit behaviour that we associate with children who have been sexually. We associate with children. Who, no, 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 thank you. Who, with, who have been sexually abused. So, for example, they have precocious sexual language. They are flirtatious, and they have inappropriate behaviour. And I can tell you, I've been working as a psychologist for for thirty over thirty years, and I've seen examples of that in young children, and it's extremely upsetting. Okay, one minute to go. I'll wind it up. Of course, there's a difference between cause and correlation. And I cannot hand in heart say that every single time a child watches one piece of pornography, my God, the whole life is ruined and they're all distorted. And many of you here tonight will have watched pornography at an inappropriately young age. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And some of you may be thinking, well, it didn't do me any harm. What's this old guy talking about? But those of you who have more insight than that will realise it can't be good for children. So I'll finish by saying, forget everything I've said. You want to challenge the stats, do it. You want to throw out the arguments, do it. Let me simplify it. I wonder how many of you here tonight, if you think responsibly about the consequences, would be happy to know that your 10-year-old brother is watching pornography every time he closes his bedroom door. Because he is. <laughs> I wonder how many of you, if you think responsibly about, your act, about the consequences, would be happy to know that your 13-year-old sister is watching degrading view, uh, pictures of women. If you're not happy with that, then I would say vote against the motion. Because the reality is, pornography is not good for children and therefore is not good for society. Thank you.
there a point in opposition? Yeah. Uh, Churchill College. Kind of in direct response to the gentleman up there. Um, it may in fact be like a symptom of a cause, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't then address it as a symptom of a cause. So, for example, we have laws against incitement of religious hatred, racial hatred. They, you know, the incitement of these things is a result of a cause. However, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't then tackle it as a direct result. I don't think it's right to say that society shouldn't dictate what we find is normal because. That's exactly what society does for us, with its laws, with its regulations. We do expect society to dictate the norms and the norms of how we see people and their behaviour. Point in abstention. Livy Potts. Uh, Livy Potts, Corpus Christi. Um, I came here this evening to hear a debate about whether or not pornography provides a good public service. But it seems that what I've actually done is turn up as a tennis match. Because all I've seen is statistics that battered forwards and backwards by the proposition and the opposition. And as a debating alumni of this uh, union once said, statistics are like miniskirts. They give you a good idea, but they hide the important bits. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of attention to 
Uh, good timing, thank you, Livy. Uh, I would like to make a promise to you there will be no statistics whatsoever. Um, I'd also like to start with a quote by uh, a member of the opposition. Uh, she said, Let me tell you about the people in porn. They're mentally ill, they're physically diseased, and drug infested. So just bear that in mind while you're listening to me, okay? <laughs> now, uh, I'd also like to apologise to you. Uh, you think my name is Johnny Ongley. It isn't. Uh, you possibly even thought, <coughs> rather embarrassingly, that my name was Johnny Cockfell, um, a name that I adopted because of my apparently at times uncanny resemblance to jackass idiot Johnny Knoxville. Uh, but it isn't. My real name is Benedict Garrett. I'm not a porn star. I'm a man who sometimes appears in pornographic productions. The truth is, I don't believe that anyone who appears in pornographic productions can be described as a star. It's simply a job like any other. And like any job, it has its ups and downs. <laughs> believe me... Uh, over the past ten years, I've had quite a selection of occupations. I've worked in one of London's top restaurants. I've worked in a bank in Canada, telling French Canadians why they couldn't get credit. I've worked in a travel company. I've worked for a consultancy firm in the city. I've done PR for speed and red light cameras uh, for the uh, London government. And up until recently, I've been a head of department and teacher within a London secondary school, heading up personal, social and health education and citizenship, as well as teaching religious studies, sociology, German, French history and A-level politics. But a job does not define you. I was never simply just a teacher. I was a man who worked as a teacher. Likewise, I'm not a porn star. I'm simply someone who works in pornography sometimes. I'm also someone's son, someone's brother. I've been on the odd occasion someone's lover. I am the owner or best friend of a Cocker Spaniel. I speak five languages. I've performed in lead roles in several musical theatre productions, starred in a Hong Kong film. I'm a Canada file, particularly interested in the politics of Quebec. I'm in no way religious, but have an interest in Judaism, the history and culture of the Jewish people, and recently been learning Hebrew. Uh, I'm a qualified my personal trainer, avid fitness enthusiast, and I'll be l running L London's Marathon this year if you'd like to support me. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I've had two books published. I will refrain from saying that I wrote them, but I compiled them and they have my name on the cover. Thank you. Uh, most recently, and something I most certainly not, was not planning on being, but I've become a carer to a former student of mine uh, who I assisted in rescuing from Pakistan after he was forced into a madrasa and suffered abuse and neglect while there. I also enjoy porn. <laughs> 
Uh, unlike most of you here today who've probably been accessing internet porn for at least the last five years, uh, I believe I was at least 16 before my first proper encounter with hardcore pornography. Um, it was a lover's guide, VHS type, I found in my father's forbidden cupboard that, <laughs> although locked, could be lifted off its hinges and then replaced. Um, <laughs> I remember that my parents had gone to Paris for a few days when I did this, and believe me, I made full use of the time and made sure to watch the film several times each day, just in case I missed a crucial detail in the storyline, you understand. <laughs> From then on, I was hooked. Paul had become part of my life. And then, when I was 18, my parents got a dial-up internet connection. Well, that was the first... What was the first thing I looked for when I got the chance? Of course. The rest is history. But what was I hooked on? Yes, undoubtedly, it was wank fodder. Uh, witnessing the actions of others whilst in a state of sexual intimacy is definitely arousing. And what's wrong with that? Masturbation is a good thing. Great Ormond Street states that uh, there are many health benefits of masturbating and having an orgasm because your body produces a pleasure hormone which makes you feel relaxed, happy and contented. And some doctors say masturbation can actually stop depression, stress and make you feel good about yourself. And pornography helped and continues to help me reach this state. But there was more to porn than simply being wank material. For a country boy like me who was largely academic, veering towards the geeky, it was the only exposure I got to sex for several years, and I certainly never saw anything like it when I was in school. Pornography does have an educational value. Save drawn diagrams and science books, I never really knew what a vagina looked like, and I certainly had no idea how to pleasure it or what a plethora of different sexual positions that I might choose to employ there are. Bearing in mind, I didn't actually lose my virginity until I was 20. I can say without a doubt that my years of viewing pornography prior to the momentous occasion definitely gave me an understanding of the female form, how to pleasure it, and an increased confidence to explore and try various things. Nothing else would have done that for me. And no matter what I saw in the porn I viewed, I've also grown to respect women and all human beings. So the idea of wanting to degrade a woman, if I indeed had ever seen that in pornography, or that really is not my taste, was uh, certainly never impacted on my own sexual activities in my private life. Uh, equally, I don't learn how to treat fellow human beings through horror films or shoot 'em ups Whilst pornography taught me some things, it certainly never replaced more important lessons learned from good parenting and decent teaching. On top of that, watching people having sex is, or at least can be, for me, aesthetically pleasing. It can be an art form. Undoubtedly, a lot of porn is poor. A lot of porn has bad quality, lacks creativity or any visual flair. But that's true in so many art forms, mainstream films and media. But that does not mean that pornography cannot, like any other art form, stimulate our senses, arouse different thoughts, raise certain questions, or simply make us smile. I actually agree with some of the points made by the opposition, but your problem is not with porn per se, but with the current state of some porn. There are those who blame pornography for certain ills in our society, particularly linked to young people. As a former teacher, I know the majority of young people watch porn. Children as young as 11 are watching full-blown hardcore pornography. This is a reality. In all honesty, I don't know whether it's necessarily a bad thing. However, in this country you are supposed to be 18 to view pornography, and young people on the whole know that. More importantly, their parents know that. Where is the parental responsibility here? Where are the internet safeguards? Where is the supervision of your child while they are exploring the internet? The internet is an amazing thing. It's like having uncontrolled access to the entire world. Allowing your child to freely roam around the internet is like dumping them in the middle of Soho and saying, have a wonder, we'll meet you back here in a few hours. <laughs> if parents really cared and were concerned, they would do something about it. Little Johnny doesn't have to have access to his laptop all the time. Little Lizzie doesn't need to have a mobile phone with internet access. Indeed, she doesn't even need to have a mobile phone. As a former PSHE teacher, I'm more than aware that there's a particular concern that pornography must be, uh, may be connected to a rise in teenage pregnancy and STIs, as mentioned up here. The United Kingdom has the highest rate of both of these in Western Europe, which immediately, without seeing any figures, raises a certain question. If young people in all of Western Europe have equal access to the same internet pornography, then why are rates so much higher in the UK? In fact, in some countries, particularly the Netherlands, Germany, Scandinavia, all of which have far lower rates of prenatal teenage pregnancy and STIs, there is, and has been for many years, a far greater access to pornographic material and exposure to other aspects of the sex industry. I believe the answer not lies in, does not lie in pornography, but in that society's attitude to pornography and sex generally. Many Dutch children will state that talking with their parents and teachers about sex is not an issue. This is rarely the case in Britain. The concept of no sex, please, we're British is still, despite an increased sexualisation in many aspects of our society, fashion, advertising, the media, very much the case. We have a very immature attitude to sex. If we do talk about it openly, it's usually in a comedic manner. When we try to address it seriously, parents and teachers often lack the confidence or indeed the experience to tackle it in a way that is appropriate for today's young people.
While we continue to treat sex as a taboo in this country and shroud it in an air of mystique, young people will want to try it. While in many European countries young people are allowed a glass of wine at dinner, we tend to have a similar attitude in the UK to booze as we do to sex. The result is an increase of binge drinking amongst the British youth, which is probably also linked to an increase in sex amongst them. If you tell someone they can't do something or shy away from talking about it, if we treat it as something that is naughty that only big people can do, then our little people will undoubtedly be more curious to try it. The problem is not porn, the problem is our immature national attitude to sex. There have been accusations from the opposing side of the exploitation of women within the porn industry. I'm not going to stand here and say that exploitation doesn't exist. I'm not going to stand here and say there isn't sometimes a link between porn production and perhaps drugs or criminality. There are corrupt individuals and people lacking any sense of decency in any industry. Do we say that the whole of the fashion industry is bad because some companies employ child labour in Pakistan? Do we call all police officers institutionally racist simply because there's been a culture within certain police forces within recent years? Do we blame the whole of the church for the actions of some pedophilic Catholic priests? Exploitation exists everywhere. When I worked in a restaurant, I regularly got less than 10 hours between the end of one shift and the start of another. According to British law, this is exploitation. As a teacher, I've been slammed against a wall twice, spat at, sworn at regularly, insulted repeatedly. Is this a treatment that a human being should have to face? Welcome to capitalism. Capitalism exploits. That is its essence. I've done jobs in the past where I've felt so degraded by the people I worked with, worked for the people who I served, that I felt at times like wanting to slip my wrists. I find it frustrating that there's often the accusation of exploitation of women in pornography. But you never hear the exploitation of the gay men who are dominated or even of the straight men in scenes where they are dominated and degraded. Pornography is such a wide term for a whole range of different genres. Porn, like sex itself, indulges in different sexual acts and in different scenarios. Believe it or not, sometimes women, even in their private sexual lives, like to be dominated, and so do men. If you genuinely believe that all porn degrades women, then you haven't seen enough porn, and you certainly haven't spent much time on a porn set, certainly not any of the ones that I've ever been on. On top of this, there are increasing numbers of female porn producers, and more and more porn that is being produced specifically for the female viewer. I'm not saying pornography is the perfect route for anybody, but I work in pornography because I enjoy it. Of course, I'm not a woman. Beakley, not I know of. Beakley, I know women who enjoy working within the industry. I've worked with women who come from a variety of backgrounds. Some are university educated, some are parents, some of them do charity work, some of them have worked in professions. I've never been on a set where the women, and where everyone in fact, are not utterly respected. Where the crew are not professional. If the woman, or indeed the man, has experienced any discomfort, we stop, we take a break, we sort it out, we have a laugh, we do our job. I think my time is up, so I'll end it there. But just to say, wank fodder, educational tour, art form, uh, pornography does an excellent form. Uh, Excellent uh, public service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnny. To close for the opposition and the entire debate, Shelley Lovin has flown in from LA. She is a former porn actress, prostitute and stripper who is now an ordained chaplain and the founder of the Pink Cross Foundation which is aimed at helping porn stars, prostitutes and people addicted to porn. So Shelley, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will tell you why the pornography does not do a pu good public service. I represent the majority. I represent the ones who are being abused every day. I'm a former porn actress. I did about 30 movies in the 90s. I worked in the U.S. porn industry, where the main porn industry is. I'm from America, and we view porn all the time. We're addicted to porn. We're also told how to lie. We're told, we tell you how glamorous it is. See how I'm a trained seal and can do that? Who do you think taught me how to be a trained seal? We were on drugs, addicted to alcohol. I was forced to do sex scenes I never agreed to. We're forced to sign contracts. Here's a three-page contract by the Free Speech Coalition. And they say things like arbitration, litigation. How's a young girl around 20, 21 years old supposed to know what these terms mean? And yet we sign a one-year contract. Oh, honey, yeah, yeah, we'll just do girl, girl, just a boy, girl. And then you show up to the set, and there's, what, like 20 guys there, and we're supposed to do anal. Yeah, I've been in a gangbang, and if anybody here has done as much gangbanging as I have, then they can talk. I've had half of my cervix removed because I've caught two sexually transmitted diseases, HPV, human papillomavirus, and herpes, a non-curable disease. 
There's nothing funny or glamorous about this industry, and I'm not the only one. Come on, Jenna Jameson, porn queen, also says that she'll never spread her legs for this industry again. She even admits that she has the classic porn star background where she's been gang raped at 14 years old. Come on, all the porn, let's talk to the porn stars here. Let's talk to them. They're all online admitting all this. I'm not by myself. Bella Donna says 99.9% .9 of porn stars have herpes. Rocco Sofriti says the same thing. It's a joke to have herpes in porn. They laugh about it. AIM, Adult Industry Medical Healthcare Foundation, the porn star clinic, where the doctor who runs it um, calls herself Dr. Sharon Mitchell in a white lab coat telling young women, we keep the adult entertainment industry safe. I have that on video. No one in this room has more irrefutable evidence than I do. I've been there, done that more than all of you have. I'm here to tell you porn is a lie. I can prove it. I brought evidence. I also have not just mine and the porn stars' words. I have the County of Los Angeles Public Health Department who says there's been 2,396 cases of chlamydia, which I dealt. And remember, they're only taking these quotes, and I'm telling you, from AIM, one porn star clinic. Those porn stars can go test other places too, but they mainly test at AIM. 26 cases, no thank you. If unreported, excuse me, 20. 26 cases of HIV, not publicized, of course, among performers. This is the California Health Department saying this. The porn star doctor who does not have a medical degree, Dr. Sharon Mitchell, former porn actress and ex-heroin user, she, she says, ah, oh, 66% of herpes, and we're pretty much up to our ass in chlamydia and gonorrhea. She says this, the porn industry says this. I'm just repeating their words to you. Porn doesn't do a good public service because it's lying to the whole public. Porn is not glamorous. I'm proof of that. I represent the majority, the voices who can't crowd. Not to mention, nobody has reached out to these people more than I have. I actually work inside the porn conventions where I help women and men. We love everybody. I go in there, and when these girls are high, or they have a little white ring, you know, they're like this. Oh my God, like, hi, I love my fans. You know, and then we go in and go, and then they come to us on the side and say, oh, I'm getting screwed by so-and-so, and, -so, and um, L.A. Direct Malls is screwing me, and it's all about, it's cutthroat fast, and um, it's just a bunch of bullshit. And I don't want you to believe the lie anymore, anymore, because I care about you as a public, I care about your kids, I care about your families. I make $60,000 a year last year. Everybody wants to go to Shelly, everybody's making all this money. I just read the damn book, like, like six months ago, and I've sold like 600 copies. I've been reaching out to these people for years, about seven, even longer years. I've worked in prisons. I've worked in rescue missions. I love these people. When these girls and these guys are crying to me and telling me about all their STDs, and they have HIV, and they're in my arms weeping. Who do you think loves them? I don't see the pornographers there. I'm the one loving these people. My family's the one. My team, Pink Cross Foundation. I've got two former porn actresses here, too, that we've helped. They're here today and a former porn actor. I brought three. I brought the most evidence out of anybody. You're not going to believe the lie anymore. I have tons and tons of evidence. I mean, I can go on and on. Okay, let's hear from the porn stars. Don't just listen to me. Mary Carey, when I'm sober, I get more anxious. When you're sober, you're forced to deal with reality. I get anxious about things. Um, when I'm drunk, I blow my money. When I'm sober, I don't want to spend my money. Okay, porn star Jenna Jameson, or excuse me, porn star Jenna Presley. What percentage of people in the industry do you think have a drug or alcohol problem? She says, huge. This is a porn star. She says, huge, I think that 90% of business does drugs or alcohol, but maybe 70% of a problem. And then, I mean, I mean there's their, these are their pictures. I have them on my website. This is the porn stars talking. Okay? We represent the majority. They're all talking about drugs. This isn't just me. They talk on their MySpaces and blogs. I'm helping girls who, who show up on sets. One girl, former porn actress from Shelvani, she showed up on a set um, in Los Angeles, and she didn't understand why there were 75 guys there. She's like, well, what's going on? My agent said there's only like 15 guys. And she shows up, and um, 75 men off the street, civilians we call them. And they did a cocky where they ejaculated all over her hair. Is that glamorous to you? Of course, they lie. We're told to lie. Okay, this is sex trafficking. Porn is modern day slavery, and I'm not the only voice. Notice the people here are the ones who make money off of it. 
No, no. You know how many people have died from the porn industry? We can't even keep count of all of them, but over 100 people have died from AIDS. It's not glamorous. No other industry kills more people. No, thank you. No other industry kills more people. There's only about, at any given time, I remember I represent the majority in Los Angeles area, about 1,500, maybe 2,000 people. We kill more people than the music industry does. I know, I did a report on it. Why? Because we're getting high. You put a bunch of, you know, I'm just going to be straight out with you. Sucking cock and fucking all day long, you're going to get diseases. You're going to get your ass ripped and torn on set. Most of these movies are filmed in private locations on a mostly male set. The girls are young. They can't read their contracts. They don't really think the lawyers are going to defend them. Who's going to defend these women on the set? No one's going to defend them. In the San Fernando Valley, where 85% of the world's adult content is created, that's where I'm talking about, the mainstream porn, which goes out worldwide. Porn is everywhere. And let me tell you, I've got missionaries, bishops writing me, pastors. I admit the Christian church is probably the main contributor to pornography, and I'm embarrassed as a Christian. Because I'm standing here in the power of Jesus Christ today. He raised me up out of an industry that should have taken my life. I should be dead. I was wasted on Jack Daniels laying on the side, you know, herpes and HPV. I've lost three babies. I've been to hell and back. And I'm in hell again because I reach out to these people. And I love them. I'm not going to give up on them. And so I'm asking you, please, please don't believe the lie of pornography. I brought lots of evidence. I'm the only one who comes with this much evidence, I might add. I didn't bring my little black book. I bought my little black bag full of evidence. Porn stars quotes. Any, anyone right here who says that they're in porn, you know, I'm telling you right now, I know the truth. And I didn't have to read from a speech either.